Well, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. We are absolutely delighted that you are joining us uh, at the I Will Tell International Film Festival's very first uh, YouTube live interview. Uh, those of you who come to the film festival know that we routinely interview global icons and filmmakers and just amazingly inspirational people from around the world all the time during the film festival, but you've told us that you want more in between festivals. So this is the very first in a series of inspirational talks. And uh, we're celebrating not just our first YouTube uh, video today, we are celebrating, of course, Human Rights Day. So it was today, uh, December 10th in 1948, that the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Declaration of Human Rights and uh, looking at all of the human rights, such as the right to life and liberty, freedom from slavery and torture, freedom of opinion and expression, and so much more. But as we are going to uh, discuss a little bit um, today, it is during times of war and conflict that all of our human rights uh, tend, to be, um, tend, tend, tend to be lost the most. And so uh, it's, if we're going to be talking about human rights, we felt that war would be one of the things we really needed to address. Now, um, what we're going to do is taking the lead from an amazing uh, man, Mr. Steve Killerley, who we'll introduce to you in a minute, is not so much look at only the negative aspects of war, but look at the idea of positive peace. And joining Steve is um, a wonderful gentleman who some of you would have met quite recently um, at the film festival, Mr. Joe Mary, who's director of the Children's Crusade. So we'll introduce them um, to you in, in full, actually, before we bring them on screen. So let me tell you a little bit about who they are. So Steve Killale, he is the founder and executive chairman of the Institute for Economics and Peace, uh, which is a global think tank that's de dedicated to building a greater understanding of the factors that create and sustain peace. He's also the creator of the innovative Global Peace Index, the world's leading measure of peace, of peacefulness used by governments, corporations, universities, and multilateral organizations worldwide. Uh, Steve is an accomplished entrepreneur, published author, and philanthropist. He has twice been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize and was nominated as one of the top 100 most influential people in armed violence reduction. And of course, we are connected to Steve because he's also the executive producer of a wonderful documentary that is timeless called Soldiers of Peace. It was innovative in its time and it's still a very classic piece of work that's still informing and educating uh, millions of people around the world. And you can see that film on our YouTube channel. The link uh, is in the bio, so do check that out. Joining Steve is Mr. Joe Mary. Joe is the director of a film that we showed much more recently, actually in the 2021 Film Festival. It's a short film called The Children's Crusade. Joe enlisted in the United States Marine Corps after watching the attacks on 9-11 while still in high school. He was deployed to Kuwait, was one of the first Marines to cross into Iraq in March of 2003, and was de deployed to Fallujah in 2004 for Operation Phantom Fury. I think I need to get my glasses on. Okay, so Joe uh, uh, was retired with full rank and benefits in 2015. And for the last several years, he has dedicated himself to fighting poverty and promoting peace through photography, film, and direct action. Joe's film, of course, is also on our YouTube channel. You'll be glad to hear. It's a wonderful eight minute award uh, winning short film. Uh, so do uh, check out the link in the bio and you can have a look at that. But for now, welcome to these amazing gentlemen, Steve and Joe. Thank you for joining us. It's just great to be here, Jen. And uh, looking forward to the conversation with Joe. Same, uh, same, Steve. I've uh, I've really enjoyed a lot of your lectures and your talks. So I appreciate what you do. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thanks. That's actually an amazing um, place to start, Steve, because what you've done has been so groundbreaking. Um, and as like Joe, so many of us have listened to so much of the, the work that you've done, but particularly in getting people to think about the idea of positive peace. Um, but before we talk about that, could you explain to us, how did someone who was uh, just, you were an IT or a businessman, uh, how did you get into um, the peace building world and 
How hard was it for them to accept you as a businessman trying to tell them how to make this human humanitarian change in the world? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And I actually get that question quite a bit, but I'm in many ways just an accidental person of peace. And I'll just give you the background. So it's a bit long, but started off in business, set up two international IT companies. One ended up being publicly listed on NASDAQ and the second one on the Australian Stock Exchange. So I made quite a bit of money out of that. Would have been about 25 years ago, I decided to take a portion of that money and get involved in developmental aid. So I decided to work with the poorest of the poor. And so that mainly focusing on Africa and or sub-Saharan Africa and the uh, Central Northeast Asia. And so quite often the poorest of the poor are in conflict you know, zones or near post-war zones. So I spent a lot of time in those areas, did projects on the rehabilitation of child soldiers captured in Uganda, child survival projects from starvation up on the border of Burundi and the Congo. And then I was in northeast Kabu in the Congo, walking through there. And it's one of the more violent places in the world. And I suddenly thought, well, what's the opposite of all these stressed out countries I'm spending time in? What are the most peaceful countries in the world? Search the internet and couldn't find anything. And that's how the Global Peace Index was born. But something really quite profound comes out of that because if a simple businessman such as myself can be walking through Africa and wonder what are the most peaceful nations in the world and it hasn't been done, then what do we know about peace? If you can't measure it, can you truly understand it? And if you can't measure it, how do you even know whether your actions are helping you or hindering you in achieving your goals? You simply don't. So what was amazing for me, and like, like I can go on about this because we spent a lot of time studying violence, we spend very little time studying peace, uh, and they're quite different things. But what was fascinating, because as you move into the peace world, a lot of people are pretty much anti-business. They, they, they see all the negative sides of business more so than the positive. But because I had all this experience in developmental aid, and probably in my family foundation, we've done over 240 projects now around the world. So it's a decent size. So I had the experience in the developmental aid, and I was a philanthropist, I got welcomed in. Now, when you get on the government side of things and the more hard-headed policy people, they see my business background, and they welcome me in. So I got the best of both worlds. So I really haven't had a lot of friction from anywhere. And I'm not in the other thing, I'm a great believer in human rights, okay, it, it, fundamental, but what are not, we're not an activist organisation. We're a research and educational organisation, which gives us positioning so we can actually influence the, all sorts of people. So we quite often work in the, uh, with the authoritarian environments as well as we work with sort of the NGOs and then also with West, Western governments and the multilaterals. Yeah, and honestly, the world is really uh, owes you a huge debt of gratitude, Steve, because what you've done is taken peace from being this really woolly thing uh, that kind of, you know, that, that the hippies and new age people talk about and put hard facts and figures and made it relevant to us. Um, later on, we're probably going to be talking about some of what those hard figures look like and what a huge difference it could make uh, to the economies of the world. But uh, thank you so much for, um, for the work that you've done and how much it's continuing uh, to impact the world. I want to ask you, Joe, because you've come at this from a completely different perspective, having having been been through war um and 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 you know that I'll, I'll let you speak for yourself some of the difficulties i know we talked quite a bit during the film festival um but i'd love to hear more about just what what it's like coming from the side of saying we, we need to stop war because look at what it's done uh to us yeah that's um that's a tough question <laughs> um it's, yeah, I, I think just knowing a little bit about my journey, um, I was a senior in uh, high school when 9-11 happened, and I walked out of class and joined the Marine Corps. Um, I graduated high school in June, started boot camp a few days later. Um, I was on the Kuwaiti border when war was declared. I was one of the first Marines running through a burning oil field in a green chemical suit uh, on D1. Uh, pushed all the way up to Baghdad. My unit fell back to Diwaniya. 
uh, and I supported, I was a combat engineer. I was not EOD. I was not bomb squad, but I, I was a support element for them. I was one of the guys kind of running around and, and assisting them. And so, you know, I got a really up close look, um, at, you know, some of these, you know, the weapons of war and what they do to people. Uh, after that, they sent me home. That was the end of my first tour. And uh, a few months later, I signed up and, and was deployed to uh, Fallujah, Iraq, uh, right after Vigilant Resolve and right before uh, Operation Phantom Fury, um, right in the heart of the, the Sunni Triangle. And it was, uh, it was ugly. It was war. Um, you know, <sighs> violence and death every day, every day. Um, but anyway, I, I ended up partaking in uh, Operation Phantom Fury. I was attached to um, a recon team. And I was one of the Marines that wired up the bridges and the roads and actually uh, detonated them. And that's what started the assault. Um, ended up hooking back around, hooking up with uh, my engineer unit and then pushed through and into the city all the way to the bridge where those Blackwater uh, contractors were killed. And uh, yeah, so anyway, we ended, up, uh, we ended up going home a few months later. Um, I saw the war, all, I, I saw the battle from literally, you know, D1 all the way through completion when we started letting people back into the city in uh, late December. And so I got to see the entire thing. Uh, I'd say the entire thing from a, you know, a very low level Marine perspective. I got to see it up close. Um, I got to see what war does to people. Um, and I, I've seen it. I've seen, I've seen, I've seen it, it brings the animal out in you. There's, there's part of us that is, I think, just part of being a human being. Um, you know, our ancestors, you know, if they needed to be violent, they had to be violent. And when you activate this part of yourself it doesn't just go away you can't just turn it off when it's over it is you spend so much time in there it, it becomes part of who you are um but anyway uh you know we took a lot of heavy losses and uh um it was actually during my second tour i just remember thinking i was like we're not going to find these weapons of mass destruction mm. they're not here and it just kind of like dawned on me, like, oh my God, we've made a horrible mistake. You know, we thought, we really did. I think all of us that went over there believed in our hearts we were making the world a better place. And uh, <laughs> here we are today. Um, so yeah, um, I got out in 06. I was discharged as a sergeant. Um, I ended up going to college on the GI Bill while I was there, they, uh, I was the platoon sergeant for a, for a National Guard unit and uh, just I ended up failing a physical really bad. And they pulled my Marine Corps health record and did a whole bunch of evals. And they said, that's it, sergeant. You know, we're going to retire you. So they retired me at sergeant uh, in 2015. And uh, anyway, it's been a ride. Mm. It's been a ride. Uh, <laughs> So, Joe, as I, as I say every time we speak, thank you so much for your service. And I, we know that you're not personally responsible for some of the decisions that are made uh, way above your head. Could you talk to us a little bit about the film, uh, The Children's Crusade, and how you were able to channel some of your experience into that and the purpose of making that film? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it was tough. It's, it's, you know, writing about this stuff, sharing these experiences, it's, uh, it's very difficult. It's, uh, um, it's not a pleasant experience, but it's kind of helping me in a way get meaning out of it. I think that if I can share my experience and, and show what it's really like, um, you know, maybe, maybe someone will say, you know what, that's not worth it. I don't want to do that. And, and so God will, and some people will watch this film and, and think twice about going to war. And so, you know, try to de-glamorize it and then also humanize all of the participants yes. um, because they are, they're just people. They're just, you end up, you know, we end up sending our children to fight our wars and the very vast majority of them are just poor farmers. They're poor country people. You know, that's, that's, they're young men and they're just poor country people. And uh, so trying to humanize them and trying to tell their side and stop trying to, 
you know, we, we always have these experiences from these very high levels, you know, the generals and the politicians looking down. Um, but I don't think people really see the people fighting our wars as human. You know, mm. they just, it gets lost. And um, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to share my experience just that way people have a better idea of kind of what they're getting themselves into. Mm. Joe, thank you so much. And thank you for continuing to serve us in, in many different ways, especially uh, through film, which as a film festival, we, we are really glad for. Um, and Steve, just uh, thinking about war and, and war being not just open uh, conflicts like, we've, like we have in Afghanistan, but we have, we, could, we, you know, we have terrorist attacks. There are lots of ways in which war and conflict represent themselves um, in our community. And there's a wonderful quote that I've, I've never forgotten in, since the last 10 or 11 years since I've seen Soldiers of Peace, where, where Jill Hicks, who was caught up in the 7-7 bombing, said, everyone says that we were at war, but I didn't know I was going to war. I thought I was just going to work. Um, and and it's, it's kind of, there's things like that that redefine war. But of course, you've redefined peace as well as not just the absence of war, but the presence of something else. So could you talk to us a little bit about that idea of positive peace and what it means? Sure. So I think the uh, story Joe just gave us was an emotionally impactful story. And you can just see looking into Joe's eyes, just the issues of war and the way it affects people. But it's just not the soldiers which get affected, it's the whole population. So we look at somewhere like the Sahel at the moment. That's the net, that for me, I think is the most intractable place in the world. If we look at the conflicts in Syria, Libya, Iraq, they were probably, they were all avoidable, okay? They were all avoidable. But the Sahel right. is just a mess. It's just right. a mess. So as we start to look into it, so you've got 75% of the uh, your population there's food insecure, for example. You've got criminal gangs running around who are capturing school kids for ransom, uh, you know, in, in the process, I was just looking in the uh, Mali yesterday, 30 people were killed in a bus when it was set on fire by a bunch of criminals. And so mm. the government's really weak, no governance. You've got Islamic uh, militias uh, uh, rife within the territories and growing in strength all the time. So <clears throat> once you get into conflict, it's very, very hard to pull out of it. And you can look today, you can go into Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, they're all decades later still really wrapped with conflict. So the question arises, how do you not get involved in conflict in the first place? And that comes back to a concept of societal resilience. Now, what we've done without getting too technical what we've done at the Institute for Economics and Peace, seeing what the Global Peace Index, we've got about 50,000 different data sets at the national level. So we've done a whole lot of mathematical modeling, statistical analysis associated to find out what are the qualities associated with highly peaceful societies. And we call that positive peace. Now, we can also turn that round into an index. And now we can see the development of societies as well. Are they, is, is the development of society improving or deteriorating? So now when you're high in positive peace, you've got the resilience so that you don't fall into conflict. And now if we can build the resilience in societies so they don't fall into conflict, then we don't end up into these places in the first place. So if we look at Syria, Iraq, Yemen, uh, Libya, now, why do they end up in conflict? Because the societal real resilience of weak, what you've got, if you've got an, a forced or imposed peace, and it's very easy to sort of break it, and the societies implode and, so, and, and all falls apart and fight, among, fight amongst themselves or fight the, with the uh, other forces when they come in. So now, the thing about positive peace, which I think is really really profound is so uh, not only does it create the conditions which create the highly peaceful societies they also build resilience which i've covered countries which are high in positive peace and improving in positive peace have on average higher than two percent per annum higher gdp growth rate and let's say countries falling in positive peace they put 
fall better on measurements of development, better on measures of well-being and happiness, better on measures of the, uh, eco of, on the environment and ecological protection, and a whole range of other things, better on measures of inclusion, equality and such. And so in many ways, as you're describing positive peace, it describes an optimal environment for human potential to flourish. And I think that's the, that's the transformation or profound part of this work. It does give us a mechanism and a guide to understand how we holistically go about developing our societies, because we all want societies which are richer and more prosperous. We want societies which got higher levels of well-being and happiness, and we want ones which are going to protect the environment. So when we look at positive peace, although we started with peace, the qualities which create peace, and this is just really very simple, creates all the other things which we think are important in society. And that's the transformational concept, particularly when it could combine with a cost the concept of systems thinking. It, it's a transformational way about going about building societies. Mm, thank you for that, Steve. And sticking with you a little bit on, on the robustness of the model, uh, what, how do you test how robust your model is? And uh, why, why, why should we believe you um, that about which you say is the most peaceful country in the world and, and, which, you, and which you say is not? Sure, yeah, there's all sorts of ways of being able to test, test robustness. But the last one we did was actually on the Positive Peace Index. And we just did this sort of five weeks ago, I think. So we've got a weighing system, okay? So this consists of 24 indicators. There's eight different domains, three indicators a domain. And the weighing we put on the indicator is dependent on the strength of the correlation it has with the Global Peace Index, okay? So it's, it's not our thoughts. It's all pretty mathematical. So what we decided to do was radically change the weights, okay? So the correlations that you're using, that gives you a weighing of 1 to 1.4, okay? Mm -hmm. So we decided to change it to a weighing of 1 to 5. And that materially didn't change the index, which is a really strong way of being able to do the robustness. So rather than using the 1 to 5 scale, we did come back to the 1 to 1.4 scale, which is based around the correlations. Since we thought that was a, 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 a more, a, 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 how can I put it? To, uh, it was a more, a, I guess, more mathematical way or a scientific way of being able to come at it. But that'd be one example of how you, do, how, how you could do it. The other thing, too, as you come back to the Global Peace Index, I think what's really important with that, when you look at most of the indexes got around the world, they're a byproduct of GDP. But peace isn't a byproduct of GDP. None of the things we've got are a byproduct to GDP. So you've got something which is really quite independent. So how do we get to the, with the Global Peace Index? How do we get it? So we basically got the, a, a set of independent experts, which consist of experts in peace and statistical modelling and indexes and things like that. So they recommend what indicators we use, the weighing for the indicators, and then sort of got the Institute for Economics and Peace, which puts the index together. So then, um, uh, uh, Steve and Joe, please jump in whenever you want to. But I, I really want to see what in a little bit. I do have a, I do have a question, Steve. How do, uh, what came first, the chicken or the egg? I, are, are these are these countries <laughs> successful because because they're peaceful, or are they peaceful because they're successful? Uh, Joe, that's a great question. And the answer to it is systemic. And this, is, this can be a big conversation. The chicken or the egg, neither of them came first. It's systemic. <laughs> so I'll give, I'll, I'm, yeah. just going to give, I'm just going to give you a really clear idea, okay? So there's eight pillars to a positive piece, or eight legs, if you like. So we'll look at three of them. So you've got free flow of information. That can be epitomised by a free press. Well-functioning government. And low levels of corruption, okay? So now, does the government affect the press or does the press affect the government? And does corruption affect the way the press operates? Does the press affect corruption and the exposure of corruption? And then does the government actually create the laws, pass things which affect corruption or does corruption affect the way the government operates? You can't pull it apart. So what you've got to do is look at this stuff systemically and look at how do you, let's say, take these eight pillars, if you like, and how do you improve all of them 
simultaneously. Now, in different environments, it can be different. We can find that the, uh, in the different stages of development, it can be different as well. And different pillars will play a bit, a, a, a be more prominent than others. But it, basically, you've got to work at it systemically and work across the lot. And that's one of the real problems with a lot of the time when we're working and trying to, let's say, do state building. We'll come in and we'll focus on a couple of things. We'll come in and maybe focus on the government, effectiveness of the government. We might focus on education and maybe trying to stimulate the business environment. But in doing that, we might forget free flow of information, equitable distribution of resources, good relationships between neighbours and the acceptance of other people's rights, for example, just to name a couple. So... In fact, one of the things we've found with our work, which is contrary to what a lot of people would think in a lot of development, is that if you just focus on education, you just focus on the business environment, you're slightly more likely to increase conflict. Because it, really? Not looking at it, yeah, not looking at it systemically, mate. Not looking wow. At it systemically. Yeah. What 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 would what would be the cause, or what do y'all speculate the cause? Why would why would stimulating those two areas result in more conflict? What is okay? Well, you're, you're ignoring group grievances, which would fit under re, either equitable distribution of resources or acceptance of the rights of others. Okay, you may be a, a, a not focusing on having a. a, a a free flow of information so if citizens are appropriately informed uh, you might have issues with the you know, your relations with the neighbors that could be neighboring countries or it could be different ethnic groups within a country that'd be some that some examples bishop figure if you get the and that's a lot of that comes back to the elites the elites really want to see the business get the uh, yeah, 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 going because that's how they make money and ignore a lot of other underlying issues Hmm. Wow. Now, so if if we were to zero in on, on a couple of countries really, really quickly, Steve, and I appreciate that you what you're looking at is the correlation, uh, and we can only speculate as, as to the causation in some cases, but but there are clearly strong correlations between some things that you're zeroing in on. I would have expected a country like Costa Rica that famously abolished its army and invested in health and education to be right up in the top five um, or the top 10. Can you talk us through a little bit um, about uh, why they fall the way, uh, you know, where they do and why your number one country is um, the most peaceful country in the world at, in 2021? Sure. Yeah, so you're right. Uh, yeah, Costa Rica is really famous for uh, yeah, yeah, getting rid of its uh, yeah, military. And, and that certainly improved its peacefulness. And it's a beautiful country. I don't know if you've been there, but it's stunning. Got great surf too, some of the best, longest left break in the world, amongst other things, and beautiful jungles. But it's got high levels of violent crime, like most of Latin America. Now, it's not as high as the rest of Latin America, but it's the violent crime which pulls it down. Now, if we went to the other end of the spectrum, in like in Costa Rica is quite peaceful. Okay, it's a, the, on global standards, it's still in the top uh, uh, quartile of the index. So, but uh, if we went to somewhere like Iceland, okay, and uh, uh, Iceland, I'd never been there before. It, we did the Global Peace Index and it came out on top. It's been on top every year. And like the joke about Iceland is, well, it's so cold, no one ever goes outside. So how can they be crying? But that, that's, that's not really true because when you look at the history of the country, it's got a stunning history of peace. The last conflict, they really fought there was about the, the, in the 11th century. Uh, uh, the, it's one of the most inhospitable uh, uh, climates in the world. And so up to really quite recently, we, everyone left their houses unlocked because if someone got caught in a storm, they could go inside your uh, house. And if you weren't home, they're quite happy to put the kettle on and fix themselves a cup of tea. It was, it was the custom. So, and the, uh, so you had all these customs build up through a harsh environment and mechanisms to resolve conflict going back to, going back for almost a thousand years. And so these are the things I believe which have led to Iceland being the peaceful nation it is today. Mm. And so this concept in 
we've hit a little bit on systems, but in systems, there's a complex concept called path dependency. And so, Joe, you would have seen this in Iraq in spades. So path dependency means that a society is moving along a path that's, that's dependent on its history and its cultural values. And if you're trying to now determine where you want to take it in the future, you have to take these into consideration and slowly change the path, not radically reconstruct it overnight. So we look at Joe, and you've probably got some, I've been really interested in your comments on this, mate, because you've got the first-hand experience, unlike me. But if you look at the invasion of Iraq, we went in and tried to radically change the society into a view of what the America thinks the society should be, rather than right. understand the direction of the society. And then sl slowly, by slowly, I don't mean 50 years, but taking time to move it in the direction you want it to go. So you got comments on that, mate? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's the... That's the whole point is that you just can't go in and force it through violence. You just can't go in and do it. I'm trying to think of any situation in history where, where what we attempted to do in Iraq and Afghanistan ever actually worked. Hmm. And I, I'm, I, maybe there have been, but I, I, I can't think of any. And you know what we saw in Afghanistan, you're right. There was just no, hap there was no happy ending at the, at the end of the road we took there. And I'm really not sure there's a happy ending at the end of the road in Iraq either, or in all of these situations where we've gone in and I think with good intentions, but like you said, we're trying to force them to be like us. And, you know, people ask me, like, are you, are you mad at these, these people you fought and the people that killed your friends? I was like, I'm not. Cause I imagine somebody coming into Texas with their guns in their tanks because they think they know what's good for us. Like, <laughs> it would be an absolute catastrophe for anybody who attempted something like that. It's just, it's, it's, it's the path we've chosen. Like you said, we have to change the path. Because if we keep going down this path and we keep doing it over and over and over again, someone has to say, stop, what we're doing isn't working. And it's, it's time to change our path. That's what, that's what I think, Steve. Yeah, now look, yeah, interesting. So thanks, Joe. Yeah. So I guess if you, what one of the things, this is one of the things I've been talking about lately, blows me away. So if we look at the war in Iraq, $3.2 trillion, that's the lowest estimate. It's probably more like five to $7 trillion. Now, that was 40 million people. Okay. That's the equivalent of 10 times the annual per capita income of an Afghan, 10 times, sorry, 100 times, 100 times yeah. the annual income of an Afghan per capita income, okay? You could have given everyone 10 times the, <laughs> their, their wages. It's more like 20 times because you've got kids taken into that. 20 times the wage, you would save 90% of your money. And if you gave that to people, would have that made a more peaceful society? So as we now start to look at some of the bigger challenges on development, and 3.2 trillion wasn't enough. <laughs> yeah. Do what you wanted with 40 million people. It means we've got to profoundly change. But if we've been, and you're right, if we look at the uh, the interventions like in the last 60 years, a lot of them have been very, very poor. There are some which are successful. East Timor is an example, but generally they're only successful when the people want you to come in, okay? Generally, if <laughs> people want you in, they will be successful. Hmm. You to to support. Hmm. The other thing is we went back to the end of the Second World War and you looked at the Marshall Plan uh, as it was implemented through Europe and then into Japan. They were successful as well, but you had societies then which would really got to the end of wanting to wage war, okay? Really were, were, really were right at the end. And what we did was we kept the establishment, okay, empowered them, didn't prosecute them for war crimes, and then kept the structures of society together, which meant they could rebuild, where if you smash it, you end up with mayhem.
Mm. Yep. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the solutions potentially, because we, we saw what happened uh, when there was a kind of mass removal of troops that, that was, it was actually the, the opposite side of the same knee jerk reaction, right? That, that forced entry and the forced expulsion, which, which has exactly the same kind of impact and clearly didn't work. Um, but I wonder if we could talk through um, from both of you um, uh, suggested solutions to how we broke a peace. You want to have a go first, Joe, and then I'll, 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 I'll jump in after that, mate. Uh, I'm a big fan of economic codependency. I think that creating um, strong economies, you know, it, it's, you know, these people were fighting. They're, they're, they're broke, they're unemployed, and they're angry. Um, if, we could, if, if we could create an environment, like you said, but a systemic environment where, where we're all kind of needing and using each other uh, in, in, in those ways. I think that has, you know, that's, that's how, I mean, Europe, I mean, Europe was an absolute disaster uh, with horrifying wars on a regular basis. And now that's the idea of France and Germany and the UK going to work, war, actual war is like laughable. And I think that was created through economic codependency, but, but um, you know, I'm a, a you're, you're going to have a much better idea, Steve, than I am. So, yeah. Yeah. No, look, uh, yeah, certainly for the EU, that economic codependence was the way they went. They started off with the steel and coal allied agreement between France and Germany, and I think there's four other nations. And from there, that built out to the uh, Schuman agreements, which then led on to the modern EU the way we see it. And you're right, you could thousand years of war and it's hard to it'd be laughable to think any of those major countries are going to go to war with each other again laughable but if we come back and we look at it the, more deeply the the issues lie much further back okay and so if we're looking we're looking specifically let's say at some of the wars in the middle east and sort of some of the other areas we tend as western governments tend to place a lot of emphasis on the human, seeing we're talking human rights and it's human rights, they all talk human rights, on human rights within our own society. But we don't actually support the implementation of the human rights in other countries unless it's a country we don't like. Okay, If it's a country yeah. we need strategic alliance with, then, well, we might huff and puff and uh, yeah, make a few <laughs> noises, but we don't really do anything. Yep. So there's this gap between the rhetoric uh, if the, uh, in Western society, particularly quite often with the leadership and the actual actions they take. And so by bridging that gap, that would be a start. Now, that doesn't mean you want to go, go and throw sanctions. And I think like economic uh, integration is really great. I spoke on a conference with the, um, the demilitarised zone in a... Uh, Korea last week on the integration yep. of North South Korea. And that's all about sort of trying to get economic integration between the two to actually build the peace and then to build the reunification. So that economic integration is key, but coming about and sort of improving people's lives makes them so much more positive than sort of putting sanctions in and now sort of the, the decreasing. The average person in a society is a, a, a level of well-being, happiness, and just food security, to be really blunt. So, look, I think it needs to be, not, I've just hit a couple, of it, uh, a couple of the areas, but we need to start to look at sort of how do you have a 20-year a, 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 a improvements in society. And, like, it can, some of them are going, like, very, very hard to make change, very, very hard. But... If you're working systemically, if you're working in a whole range of countries, you'll find different ones will open up at different times. You've got an opportunity, you move through, and you create a society which is more inclusive, one which is built more, built more around positive peace. Now it will slowly get change gradually. But one of the things, and a really deep philosophical question, a philosophical point, so we look at the world we live in, just the nature of life is built of eating other living creatures. How violent is that? Okay, Nothing exists without leaving, eating another living creature. 
So built within the framework, very world we're in, we've got this a, a terribly violent act, yet we have the concept of peace, and that transcends it. And so if we look at these two competing influences, and like some people have called it good and evil, okay, what motivates good, what motivates evil, and it's... Joe says we've got this dependency for cooperation, love, uh, uh, joy and happiness, but also built into our limbic brain, we've also got the ability for violence. And when unleashed, okay, it's very hard to put the genie back in the bottle. And so right. we've got the societies which can actually create the right structures, positive peace, then we're a lot less these really uh, 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 violent emotions will come to the fore. So we, we are starting uh, to run out of time, but I just got, I've got two or three quick questions I, I, I really want to ask you um, ask you both. And of course, if any of you wants to jump in on anything, then please do so. Um, but I wanted to touch um, particularly, see, I, and one of the things I really liked about um, the model as a lay person is that you do measure the fact that there are lots of, uh, there are developed countries that um, support wars in less developed countries and, they, and they're penalized for that on, on the index, which is awesome. I, I probably would argue that they should be penalized um, much more. But if you, if, you look at, if you look around the world and um, again, as a lay person looking at war, it tends to be the, the black and brown people of the world that suffer the most. And sometimes it's because of resources in their country. Sometimes it's because of instigations for other reasons. Sometimes it's because of um, tribalism that's been um, kind of, uh, what's that word, kind of brought to, to fever pitch. I wondered what you thought about how fixing the, the issue of racism on a, on a global scale could help broker more peace in the world. Well, obviously it's important to me that's, and so that some part of this comes back to identity. What do I, we identify with? And a lot of the time that's sort of racism I identify with either, and it's, it's a lot more than just racism because it's religious conflicts, it's the ethnic divisions, it's just 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 not the colour of the skin because you can, or you would have seen, you can go within Africa and you've got a lot of tribal conflicts there. So the issue is the concept of identity and what we see as being us and what we see as being them. And so built deep within our, in our psyches is this concept of categorisation. That's why I know I'm sitting on a chair. It'd be really hard if each time I came in and had to redetermine what a chair was. So we've just got this concept of categorization built in. So the concept of categorization that creates for racial profiling, they look like me, those ones don't, they speak my language, those other ones don't. Gee, they haven't got my value system, these other ones have. And so that's, that's right. built in. But the question is for me anyway, is how you build in an inclusive set of what 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 you know, if, if what is me okay and that you can do that you can do sort of family everyone loves family well almost everyone so they so working out so for me the whole thing is like us building out what are the touch points where we're the same and similar and back to what joe's saying sort of if you've got another group of people in the uh, see this at work. He employed Muslims, I employed Jews, I've got people from, I don't know, 15 different countries and sort of work with someone. It's a great way to get to understand them. <laughs> it really is. And so they con part of it, that concept of economic inclusions really is part of it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Joe. You were making a lot of agreeing noises there. Is there anything you wanted to add? <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I wonder, the way we're able to do these kinds of things to people is by dehumanizing them. Uh -huh. There's this nature, this human nature to see us and to see them. And like, Steve, what do you think? If 9-11, if instead of being carried out by Al-Qaeda, was carried out by a bunch of white supremacists and <laughs> from Munich, do you think we would have shocked and awed Germany? You think we would have put <laughs> boots on the ground? you know, in Germany, would we have done that? And I don't think so. I don't no. think so. Um, and, and so racism does play a very big part of it because it's, it's maybe the most profound way that people try to 
divide people up into us and them. Yeah. And so, so I, I do believe that racism plays a very, very large part in it, but it's, it's, it's not overt. It's, it's a subconscious uh, sort of racism is what I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, look, yeah. I think. yeah, look, I think they're, right. they're, they're, they're great points, Joe, great points. I would love to keep talking to you all about so much more in so much more detail, but we're kind of definitely winding up. I wanted to ask you, particularly because we run a film festival, about your films, the impact of your film. I mean, and uh, Steve, uh, Soldiers of Peace was 10, 11 years ago and it's still having an impact. And Joe, you've been doing lots of work on the ground with the Children's Crusade. So uh, could we hear a bit from you about how you've used filmmaking in um, the peace process? Yeah, for me, it uh, once we uh, had done the Global Peace Index, I realised there was a story there to be told, and that's what uh, caused Soldiers of Peace to be done. And when we did it in its time, we really aimed for something which was going to be timeless. We wanted something which would exist and uh, you'd be topical uh, 20 years down the track. And this stage, it seems like we it seems like we've done it. The time we run when. 14 different international uh, uh, awards, which was pretty pretty good. Got the World Shift Award at the, at the Monaco Film Festival, which I think was probably the highlight of it. Wow. Oh, sorry, the Cairns Film Festival. I think that was the highlight <laughs> of it. Uh, but, the, uh, yeah, but sort of all in all, it was a great project to do. One of the things which really struck me, Michael Douglas did the voiceover for the movie. Yeah. He's got the most beautiful voice. And he said, look, normally quarter of a million dollars he charges for that. He says, look, seeing it, doing it for a good cause and it's coming out of a, 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 a not-for-profit, not I'll charge you 5000 But I want you to donate it to my charity. Oh. What a great guy. What a great wow. guy. Wow. Like when you, when you meet him too, he's, he really is quite a humble guy. He's, I can remember sort of meeting him once in uh, Paris at a, 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 a group Global Zero put on a conference there on the on global disarmament of nuclear weapons, and he was one of the uh, supporters of that and sort of had a decent chat with him then. And like he's just really, re really is very modest guy. Mm, right. Thank you. Thank you. And Joe, what's been happening with the Children's Crusade? It's um, we're kind of wrapping up the our festival submissions and and hoping to get on to our next project. And so uh, I've got some stuff I'm working on. I've been writing a lot and uh, I'll start trying to push it out there and see if we can get another short made. But yeah, that's that's what's going on with me. Yeah. I um, mean, one of the things that the jury said, actually, about the Children's Crusade is that one of the jurors um, said, oh, I'd love to see this made into a feature. Are you, are you thinking <laughs> about doing something like that? Um, you know, my dream is to one day make the, the platoon or the full metal jacket of my generation. That would, <laughs> that would be, you know, that would be amazing. I would love but to. But for peace, to obviously. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it, to, to give a very honest and very brutal look at, at, at what it's like. It's not supposed to be entertainment. It's supposed to be educational. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, that, yeah. So, but yeah, that's, that's, that's the point. It's not to glamorize war. It's to give a very brutal and honest look at it. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And Steve, I mean, you've done so much, it seems a sacrilege to ask this question, but what's next for you? Oh, uh, well, yeah, it's few, oh, okay, you know, I've got a couple of interesting things. So one is the, uh, we've, we've, worked out a, we've worked out a framework for being able to uh, analyze societal systems so we can really understand the way they work. And from there now, you can start to design institutions which are systemic based because that, isn't that what we've got today? So that's a big subject. So I won't go into that in more detail. But the other one, which I'm doing, I'm putting an investment into a company at the moment, which can use the camera, which is on my computer now, filming me, and to listen to my voice to be able to determine a person's emotional state. And so ah. we've got a series of the ways of now being able to do run questionnaires on them to be able to determine it. And what we're going to do for that then is launch a project to be able to measure uh, people's happiness or sense of inner peace. And what we're going to do then is to go around the world with the aim of trying to find the societies which are most happiness with the most inner peace, then come back 
and understand the social dynamics around them, which makes them that way. Now, today, there's two measures of well-being or happiness. Uh, one is using uh, socioeconomic measures, like that's life expectancy, education levels, et cetera. But you always find the rich nations at the top. So Finland comes out at the top there. The others are using surveys, but surveys are really terribly problematic, uh, particularly in authoritarian societies, for example, or in societies where only a fool tells the, says what they think. You've got to be right. a lot more subtle to be smart. So, yes. so this moves way beyond that so that's the so that's another one i'm doing you know i also got an investment in a flying car so it's got the leading <laughs> hey, excellent. A bit. So got four percent of that company but it's it, 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 it's fabulous as well yeah so there's a couple of things Wow. Well, thank you both so much. We have definitely come uh, to the end of our time. I'll give you um, a couple of minutes um, to think about just while I close up, if there are any final words you'd like to, um, to give um, to people. Actually, there was, there was one question. Let's see if I, see if I can find it. There's one question I really wanted to ask you, um, Steve, about your book. We haven't talked about your book. And I, oh, if we could oh, just... Yeah, 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 yeah. Let, now let's get something in on the, on the book. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it has an amazing title, um, Peace in the Age of Chaos. Um, so I, 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 want to, I, I want to ask this, um, this question. So, so in, in the book, you said that the best, um, and in the tagline is the best solution for a sustainable future. You said that very few of us are tall stories or Gandhis. Um, so, but we're just ordinary human beings caught in the groove of working or bringing up families or for too many, merely surviving. Our lives offer only limited choices. However, peace does start with the individual. And even in the most mundane of lives, it can be expressed in vivid and compelling ways. Can you expand a little bit on that? Such a, a, a beautiful and encouraging quote for us to end on. Yeah, well, sort of in many ways, like peace just it ripples out from our interactions with other people, okay? So look, it's like simple things, like it's going into the coffee shop and getting your coffee in the morning, smiling and saying something that pleasant behind the counter. It's a, seeing, a, seeing a kid on the street commenting on the kid it's like in our personal in our families in our personal relationships how do you just sort of be a little bit more uh, understanding okay uh, if you feel like you, your partner's annoying you you want to uh, you snap at them how do you just we all have that well yeah. i don't <laughs> <laughs> we all we, we, we all have that how do you just hold back for a, 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 a 15 seconds and come at it from a different angle. And mm. look, in a business environment or if someone's trying to bully you, push you around, doesn't mean you've got to be weak, okay? In Australia, we've got this saying of a doormat. Uh, you don't want to be a doormat because everyone comes in and wipes their, dirty, uh, 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 their dirt off their feet on you. You don't want to be a doormat. But on the other hand, it's like it, 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 it just, it's just those little things and the way you interact with other people. And uh, you, it, it, it's got a ripple effect, really has a ripple effect. Right. And, that, and sort of, it's a bit, bit more, yeah, it's a bit more than that. You can, then if you want to get engaged in a local group, and like sort of beautiful little ones created, an act of kindness created up a local area recently. So I live in an affluent suburb, it's to collect food and then it takes us to one of the poor areas in Sydney and donates it. It's 60 people and it's purely all a, a voluntary. So, Go and do something like that. Go and help the people who are less fortunate. Just to, you don't have to give up much. Just give up two hours a week or something. All those little things, they, 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 they count. They count. So someone like me, like I've had a lot of impact, but is my impact more than a million people doing two hours a week? I doubt it. Yep. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And Joe, um, what would you, what, what advice would you give to, to ordinary people wanting to walk uh, the path of peace? Or what, 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 uh, what are the daily things you're doing in your life to help foster peace? You know, the, you know, the big takeaway, I think, is we just need to be thinking a lot harder about deploying our military and going to war. And 
we have enough of our own problems back here at home. Like, like Steve said, we've spent, you know, five or six trillion dollars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, we've lost over 7,000 troops, more than 7,000 contractors, and probably, you know, ha between half a million and a million people have lost their lives as a direct result of these engagements. And, you know, I, I want to see, I want to see us invest in peace and in prosperity here in the U.S. the same way we invest in other countries when we go to war like mm. let's invest in our let's invest in making the world a better place um and and i do i think we're in a bad spot i think we're seeing a lot of um as well here in the u.s i we're seeing you know some really really unfortunate um things take place and i think it's because we, we seem to be more focused on other people's problems than our own problems mm. and um you know if we could if we could take back that six trillion dollars in those fifteen thousand lives and put them put taking that time and that money and those resources and those people and put them to work here on our own problems our hospitals our schools our roads our dams man, you know, figuring out how to how to reduce crime in our prison population um you know, we need to bring the kind of energy we took to iraq and afghanistan bring it here Mm -hmm. Bring that, bring that energy, bring those human lives, bring that money back here. And, uh, you know, this, this, these wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, I think will go down as one of the greatest, uh, not just moral catastrophes, but financial, <laughs> just exactly. one of the stupidest things. If you were to ask somebody, what is the stupidest thing you can do with $6 trillion? I think the U S just answered that question. I really do. Mm, fascinating. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, so very much. It's, I, 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 I want to keep asking you for last words, but I know I can't string it out. Um, uh, to everyone who's listening, thank you so much. Uh, do let us know if you want more of these riveting uh, conversations. Remember to check out Soldiers of Peace in the link below. Check out the Children's Crusade and check out Peace in the Age of Chaos by Steve Killalay. We're going to put the link to all of those uh, in the bars. We want to hear from you what your thoughts are on peace. What are you doing uh, to book a peace in uh, your daily life, whether you're doing it on the, the micro or the macro scale. But for now, for our wonderful guests who have given so much actually of their lives in very different ways, but all focused on uh, making the world a more peaceful place for you and I. My very, very sincere thank you uh, to you, Steve and Joe. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and uh, happy Human Rights Day. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks, Jen. And thank you, Steve. Yeah.